Okay, so our final speaker of the semester is going to be Kevin Hodges, who's in the who's in the department the Department of Divinity at Trinity College at U of T, and he studies uh, early Christianity and uh, late antiquity in the Mediterranean and uh, all kinds of esoteric belief systems of the period, and he's going to be giving a talk on vegetarianism and veganism in the ancient Greek world, uh, where we have uh, Pythagoras and other, other philosophers and movements that advocated uh, ab abstinence from meat. And this promises to be a really interesting lecture. Kevin was a speaker here last year, and he gave a really brilliant talk on, on that was quite interdisciplinary. So, so I'm really looking forward to this, and we're happy to have him tonight. Thank you. So uh, you've asked me, um, I believe it was you and, and or Paul, mm -hmm. to talk about vegetarianism and the ancient Greek world. Uh, Hellenic world, yeah. and uh, we might begin by asking, what does it mean, the ancient Greek world? And who were they? Um, it isn't so simple as we think, because probably in 500 to 600 BC, there were many Greek nations with different languages, um, different cultures, uh, all of this going on, but uh, for us, for the sake of our discussion, it really begins with a pretty famous figure. Can you guess who that is? No, no, no. Okay. Well, the, the constitution of the ancient Hellenic world begins with Alexander the Great, actually. Oh. So, Alexander the Great, of course, being born in, in Macedonia, uh, when was it? In 356 BC, um, was a young man. Uh, Evidently born with a fire burning in him somehow or another. Um, maybe the world was already ready for him and, and he came and had just what it took, but um, his conquest brought about the Hellenic culture of the, of the whole Mediterranean world. Uh, first he went to conquer the Persians, because there was already a grudge there. The Persians had conquered Asia Minor and, and part of the Greek mainland. Uh, before in the time of Leonides, um, so it was it was time for the Macedonians and the Greeks to have their their conquest. Uh, in the process, it was a it was a long period of, of uh, fighting against the, the Persian uh, Empire. The um, what was it the uh, Archimanid uh, dynasty? About ten years. During that time, he consolidated um, a lot of soldiers from different areas of what we might now uh, think of as the ancient Greeks. There were um, people who spoke Attic, there were Ionic speakers, there were Doric speakers, there were speakers from other areas. And what happened um, in, the, in the course of his military campaigns is that there became a, a, a sort of a manifestation of a leveling of the language into something we might call the koine, the, the common tongue. And so um, the genesis of the, of the koine uh, Greek language uh, made a lot of things possible throughout the empire. So, so what Alexander the Great provided for us, and, and it was a, you know, lots of people were, were harmed and, and murdered and <laughs> their lives were ruined, and it was just a terrible thing, as war is always a terrible thing. But what happened is, as a result of these efforts was a, um, a sort of a unified empire. I mean, uh, yes, there was still, the, the Roman Empire was over there and it was kind of babyish already, but here comes uh, Alexander the Great. He conquers Persia and then he sets out to go all the way to the Indus Valley, which he did. So, um, and this is highly significant for our discussion of vegetarianism as I, I think you're about to find out. So in the year 326, um, he and his troops managed to get all the way to India. So if you can imagine going through Iran, you know, through the Persian Empire, and then coming down, where did he go through? Is it anybody? Greece. Afghanistan. Afghanistan, very important. He went through Afghanistan. He went through areas uh, that we now call Pakistan. He went through um, the, the northern area and then came down. Um, 
And he went down uh, one of the cities, Taxila, and I haven't even tried to find out what modern city that is today, but <laughs> one of you guys can figure it's that still, out. Still hmm? Is it still Taxila? I think so, yeah. You yeah, I'm not sure. Gotta... I'm not sure. It's, so uh, he was a bit exasperated when he came to India. He found out the Indians didn't want to fight him for the most part. A lot of them knew he was coming, and so they just went about their business and pretended that they weren't even there and <laughs> didn't resist or anything. Some did. There was some fighting in India, in, in India. some of the Rajas and the um, Andor kings there um, were willing to put up a fight, but um, he didn't get what he wanted. Instead, he got something much better. Can anyone guess what that might be? Wisdom. Yes, but... Uh, incidentally, I, I don't want this to be like a real formal academic lecture. I, I want it to be uh, more of an informal sort of talk, so feel free to interrupt and ask questions as we go, okay? Sure. I, I appreciate it because it uh, gives me a break for a moment. <clears throat> well, so what he encountered there was um, something that we call the gymnosophists. That's what oh. the Greeks call them, the gymnosophists. It means the naked wise people. And um, evidently, he encountered... They're basically ascetics, right? Yeah, basically yeah. ascetics, but um, uh, representatives of the, of the local kind of um, spiritual traditions mm -hmm. or religious traditions or whatever. Um, he encountered, first, he, uh, he, he encountered four famous rishis that were there. Uh, great wise men. And I'm sorry, ladies. No, no wise ladies. At least uh, he didn't encounter them. They, I guess the Indians were keeping them secret. <laughs> um, but uh, like his uh, encounter with the uh, with the wise man on the um, on the island of Cyprus, um, he was perplexed. First, he uh, he meets this person. Uh, who the Greek historians call Kalanus. And then Kalanus says, well, you have to meet my guru, and finally shows him where to go and find him, and there is a discussion. You can read about this in uh, uh, several of the accounts. I mean, Plu uh, Porphyry and Plutarch uh, talk <coughs> about this, and uh, they call them the Brahmanis. In Greek it's called Brahmanis. You can see that's an adaption of the word Brahmin, the Brahmins. So uh, what's interesting is that um, Alexander the Great is so impressed and, and uh, so shook up by what he encounters, the wisdom of the Brahmanis, that he actually takes back the guru of Kalamis, whose uh, name was uh, uh, in Greek, Dandamis. Dandamis, Dandamis um, ultimately uh, prophesied the death, they say prophesied the death of Alexander the Great in Babylon prior to um, him burning himself to death. So um, there is a theory, of course, that um, these Brahmanis were actually Jains. We don't really know for sure. We never will. There's also a theory that there was some um, connection to early Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, one of the points that is quite interesting about what Alexander the Great did is that he paved the way in Afghanistan for a huge Buddhist civilization and uh, yeah. empire there. So um, what Alexander the Great and the Hellenic influence brought to Afghanistan and India was a, uh, a sort of format, an artistic tradition that allowed the portrayal um, and completely and dynamically influenced the expression of Buddhism in India and Afghanistan. So whenever you look at statues of the Buddha today, you're actually looking at, um, likely you're looking at forms that are similar to Hercules or Heracles. So, so they're based on the early uh, Hellenic statue uh, uh, representations that were, that were brought there. And so I'm kind of fascinated by that myself. And now they're, um, they're excavating in Afghanistan or they have been over the years, uh, various uh, cities and looking at what developed there. Um, so it, it's very interesting. However, what is the connection? Where, where, is, where, is, the, where is the vegan connection in all of this? Well, um, Porfiry 
describes these Brahmanis as being men who lived on milk and fruit. That's what he calls it, milk and fruit. Um, obviously, when we're looking at Indian civilization, you're not going to see pure veganism, but you're going to see um, uh, very, very dedicated vegetarianism. So there's always going to be, um, almost always, there are some exceptions, uh, there's going to be the presence of, of cow's milk and goat milk and fruits. Um, for the gymnosophists, these naked men who, who lived in the forest and slept on leaves, they were more likely to abstain from root vegetables and from uh, other things and just subsist entirely on fruit. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dardanus uh, was brought back um, to Babylon by Alexander the Great. And this man himself and his teachings had an enormous influence on what later would be um, Greek philosophy. However, the connection doesn't just begin there. Uh, from what I've been able to read, and um, there, there seems to be, there's an indication that, uh, for instance, the Egyptians were in contact with Indus Valley civilization, perhaps as long ago as 5,000 years ago. And there is um, a conversation of, of ideas and worldviews going back and forth, because as many of you know, the elite upper-class Egyptians were vegetarians from earliest times, the best we can tell. They're noted for uh, shaving their entire bodies, uh, bathing three times a day, uh, dressing in white linen and cotton, and never eating the flesh of any animal. Including the royal <coughs> Including the royal The pharaohs were all vegetarians. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure they all were. You know, the ideal I, ones. Because the pharaohs were people of privilege, and they had to... Uh, demonstrate their their status and things, especially when it might come to royal dinners and, and um, uh, affairs of state with other nations and things. So that is so interesting. I didn't know that at all. But uh, we're in the in uh, e, the Egyptian cosmology and uh, and uh, religious traditions. Like weren't there festivals like centered around like the slaughter and consumption of animals as we see in so many parts of the world, like the like the, the Athos bull I think was supposed to be consumed after. Oh, but they were making a god. You see. Yeah, they were mummifying the, the bulls. And they were putting them in very elaborate sarcophaguses. Sarcophagi. Yeah. Um, so the, that was the apotheosis of that bull. Mm -hmm. That bull and the mummy became, a, um, well, per se, a living representation or embodiment of the, of the divine God connected to it. Yes? So if the upper class in Rome you can eat animals, that it would make sense that no Egyptians would eat animals, right? Or would, like, lower classes? It's hard to say, but I can tell you one thing. In the ancient world, eating meat was a luxury. Right. It was a, it was a luxury. It was a, something that was not affordable for most people. And, and they want to do what the upper class people were doing, right? Yeah. Yeah, but uh, there, there's you know there's uh, records of, for instance, the Egyptians' uh, attitude towards the Hyksos, or the Semitic people that were with them for a while, because these Hyksos, these Semitic people, were sheep herders and uh, uh, lived off the uh, the sheep, and um, the, the traditional Egyptians looked at them with a great deal of disdain because they would eat the flesh of the sheep. Sheep. Is that uh, Joseph in the biblical Joseph time? Maybe. The temp temple grand? Yeah, maybe. We, we don't really know. He might have been a real person. There There is uh, different kinds of uh, archaeological information coming out now that might suggest that. Uh, but uh, if if there was any kind of Semitic people that we might call the, the Hebrews, or there, there's one Stella that has a word that uh, uh, says Ibiru. And it may be the word for Hebrew, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they, they may have been there, but if, if, the, um, if the Ibiru were the Hyksos people, then it makes perfect sense. Uh, but I've heard, that, uh, there, but I've heard that there's actually mounting evidence that Joseph was... There, there was a, there was a his, historical figure that... That there, there was, there was a, a historical, a, a historical figure that 
Yeah. Can be compared to the Joe Joe Joseph. Joseph. Yes, that, yeah. that's the one. That's the one you're thinking yeah. of. I, I read it. And especially in comparison to other biblical figures where no archaeological. Yeah. archaeological it, it's quite possible. Um, I mean, we, we don't really think that, for instance, the Exodus happened the way it's recorded. That, yeah. that text is probably very symbolical and, yeah. and not meant it to. Is, it is a Yeah. Um, so. Um, Back to Alexander the Great. So what Alexander the Great gave to us, the, the Greek world, um, he took at least five different Greek um, tribes or regions and more or less united them, and he gave a lingua franca to the, to the entire Mediterranean world. Uh, and in fact, um, this Koine Greek language was the language of the empire until about the third century AD. And um, I bet all of you thought that they spoke Latin in Italy. Am I not right? <laughs> well, you know what? Very few people in Italy spoke uh, Latin. Um, there was one tribe called the Latins, of course, who probably originated the language, and it was probably related to Etruscan language. But all the literature, hmm? all the literature and urban right. civilization in Latin. Yeah, the, was, arist the aristocrats. Um, that was all, all the common people were speaking. Yeah, the common Greek. people were speaking Greek. They were speaking quite. They were speaking. They were and speaking the Latin was distinguishing the Aristotle. all the way up to uh, Naples, you know, um, and, and up above. They were all speaking Greek. Um, at um, we can say in the first century A.D., say 50 A.D., you go to the city of Rome. Um, how many of the people there do you think were speaking Greek? Somebody make a guess. Probably twenty. How many? Probably plenty, the majority, I guess. All of the slaves, and that means probably 85% of the people living in, in Rome wow. were slaves, and they were speaking Greek. Um, in fact, um, Greek uh, philosophers and orators were well known to go to Rome and find a rich family and sell themselves into slavery uh, in order to better their career there. <laughs> and to teach the Roman kids. Um, the Romans had no theology whatsoever. They borrowed all of it from the Greeks. Um, they just had the names of their gods, which they knew were the uh, equivalent to the Greek gods and goddesses. Um, and, and thus the entire um, tradition of, of, of ritual practices also were taken from the Greeks, um, which is quite interesting. And we'll talk a little bit more I hope that we'll get to it about the uh, temple and sacrificial system that the Roman Empire used and what, what it meant and why, what vegetarian uh, practices meant in light of that. So, all right. So why don't we talk now a little bit about the, the economy of the ancient Greek world and um, the basic foodstuffs. Now, we've already mentioned, for instance, that um, Meat eating was um, much uh, much rarer than it is today. Um, your average person subsisted mostly on bread and um, whatever vegetables could be grown, you know, very close by, and and with very few things, uh, uh, exotic things uh, purchased. Now, were there were there butcher markets? Yes, but but guess what they were. They were like outlets for, for selling animals that were sacrificed in the temples. So if any of you have uh, had any interest in early Christianity, you know that that's very problematic. So uh, for that reason, a lot of early Christians were vegetarians, not because they had a special um, feeling towards the animals or about suffering or or a belief in the dignity of all animals, but simply because um, they were making a statement uh, of rejection of the imperial cult um, and of, of state religious practices. Uh, religion, in, in terms of the Roman Empire, was not any different right, and not at all separable from the government itself. So think about that for a minute. It's, that's a pretty provocative idea. Um, Rejecting the meat was the same as not as refusing to pour a glass of wine to the emperor. Exactly, exactly. And um, 
and the honoring and the worship of the demons. Yeah. So, and yeah, that sounds like demons, doesn't it? We, English word demons comes from the word demon, which is a Greek word. Um, the Latin word is genius, of course. Um, but the early Christian movement uh, decided, probably in the time of uh, Justin Martyr, that these demons were um, evil spirits, um, simply because they didn't want to acknowledge uh, pre-Christian religious traditions. Mm -hmm. So they said, out with all of that, we'll just demonize them. Wink, wink. Yeah. Um, however, so uh, if we look at the um, the economic exchange and, and transportation and the commercial industry of food in the ancient uh, Roman, Greco-Roman Empire. Um, what do you think that the main commodities were? S somebody, I know, you probably know. I'll bet you know all. So, first, first and most obvious is grain. There was a lot of shipments of grain through the Mediterranean on the on the boats. Next, what would there be? Olives? Olives. Olive oil. Olives and olive oil, but more olive oil than anything. Mm. And the third? Maybe fish. Wine. 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 Wine was a big deal back then mm. because um, it ensured people uh, having safe water. So they mixed their, their water with wine, usually uh, uh, three parts to one part. Because it would sterilize it. And it would sterilize and make the water safe enough. <laughs> exactly. So it was actually uh, sort of a preventative. It wasn't that they were necessarily drinking wine because they wanted to feel good and, and have parties <laughs> and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but someone said fish, and, and you're right. Um, one of the biggest um, industrial enterprises in the Mediterranean world at that time was catching small uh, fish like sardines and other kinds of small fish and preserving them with salt. There was also another industry of making fish sauce, uh, kind of the consistency of a, like a, a syrup or a honey. It would have been made with salt and, and, and rendered down. Um, interestingly enough, uh, one of the larger contractors for the imperial government for these uh, preserved fish that was uh, put in jars was uh, on the Sea of Galilee. So the, the fisher people, uh, the fishing industry on the Sea of Galilee was engaged in, in a commercial industry and they had a contract with the Roman government to supply shiploads of preserved fish. So you, you do see that. You don't see too much, um, at least I'm completely unaware of any other kind of prepared animal stuffs. Um, there might have been cheeses uh, and, and things like that that were transported and traded in the, in the commerce of the Roman Empire. But, um, you know, as far as, well, for instance, uh, well, there was one thing, salami. Who, who knows where salami first comes from? Salamis. Salamis. Yeah, Lebanon. Salami. So, so um, according to what we know, uh, uh, meat tubes, <laughs> were first prepared in, in Lebanon about 4,000 years ago. Um, so they would grind or chop the stuff and put it inside of intestines and then smoke it, you know, with lots of salt and spices. And um, This is one of the staples of the, of the Roman uh, uh, army. Probably Alexander's army took a lot of salamis with them, along with their beans and their rice. Um, incidentally, um, just a break from that line of thought. Um, how many of you have seen the movie Gladiator? Everybody, right? Was it cool or what? <laughs> well, you know, the thing that I liked about it is I saw that there was a lot of detail to, um, to contextual history there. And you could see things that they actually did. One thing that you didn't see was that the gladiatorial schools only served vegetarian food. In fact, nearly all of the gladiators that we know of in the Roman Empire were only allowed to eat vegetarian meals. Huh. Did you know that? Do you know why? Why? They felt that meat was a stimulant and would lead the gladiators to not be in control of their state of mind out on the, in the arena. 
and were more prone to kill their opponent. Most of the contests of the gladiators didn't result in death. They were merely for entertainment. I mean, they were dangerous, but they didn't um, want the gladiators to kill each other necessarily. Mm -hmm. Because if there was going to be a death match, it cost a lot more money. <laughs> so you didn't waste good money. You didn't waste good money. So the, the, uh, the gladiators themselves were fed a, uh, a diet that would be more conducive to uh, a good control of their state of mind. That, that's really interesting. So it seems to me that you're saying, you're saying that both the stereotype of the, the Roman populace reveling in these, these really bloody competitions is, for the large part, inaccurate? Well, I think that they did revel. Um, I just think that the, um, the gladiators themselves are much more in control mm -hmm. than, than you think. And especially the people that, the, the men and the women who owned gladiatorial schools or teams of gladiators, they, they were in it to make money. And uh, you don't make money when your gladiators are killed, especially if they're good ones. Mm -hmm. So, but what about the input of the slave? I guess slaves cost money too, but slaves you get the yeah. sense, maybe I'm getting from the movie too, that there's just this inflow of cheap human flesh to throw into the arena. Oh, I'm sure there was, but uh, they didn't last long, and they weren't valued as much. I mean, people wanted to see skill. And there's the acts of the Christian martyrs, and, and it, I mean, like to, to be fair, that, 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 was partly, that was partly early Christian propaganda, but... Well, like, most likely. But like, yeah. it was most likely that the Christians were put in the arena to be devoured. Yeah. Best we can tell, there are very few Christians that were killed in the, yeah. In the arenas. Yeah, very because I, I hear that the, 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 the idea of how many Christians were, were martyred in the arena is grossly inflated. Grossly, grossly yeah. inflated. I mean, you know, there used to be estimations of like a million or two. And then, then it was cut down to like 300,000. And now we know that it's less than 10,000. Wow. Yeah, and that's over a period of three hundred years. Yeah, because because it wasn't the persecution wasn't constant. Like there were times where it or like and there were there were actual like there were more like for Christians, and there were times where for the most part no one really cared. Yeah, yeah. There was also a time when when people could buy um, they could buy a, a like a license or a certificate that says I'm compliant with imperial requirements. You know, I have honored the emperor by dropping the handkerchief or pouring the glass of yeah. wine. And you could carry those. Uh, but if you were a Christian, you could also purchase them through a second party, uh, kind of like a counterfeit one that you could carry with you, so you wouldn't be bothered. And most people did that if they could. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right, let's, let's go on a little bit. So we, we mentioned the basis of the, of the food economy. And, and you know, that was a big deal. For the um, for the uh, Greco-Roman Empire, um, you know they, they did transport cattle a little bit on boats, but not as much as you'd think. Um, when when precious metals came along and, and coins and things, um, they represented the original idea of wealth. Uh, those of you who heard my lecture last year uh, remembered the idea about wealth and invisible economies. Do you remember that? Well, then invisible. Yeah, the, the invisible economy. So, um, sacrifice, blood, the, the invisible economy between the invisible worlds and the material world in the yeah. ancient yeah. times. Yes, yeah, so, so, this is an exchange. So, uh, you know, the uh, coins, bronze, um, large bronze talents, um, coins, uh, they gradually replaced the uh, literal transportation of cattle. Uh, that would be cows, goats, sheep, uh, whatever else. Uh, so they're, they're in, in the Greco-Roman times, the transportation of actual animals became more unusual or more rare than it might have been, say, 2,000 years before. Um, so, yeah, well, uh, for, for those of you who are interested in such things, one of the other big commodities was uh, papyrus, papyrus sheets. So, um, yeah. anybody know where they first started making papyrus sheets? Egypt, right? Uh, no. Hmm. Biblos, from which we get the word um, um, Biblos in Greek, which means book, right? So, um, they first started making papyrus and Biblos, but the Egyptians are the ones who later on dominated the scene with, with 
thinking, um, um, I guess you call it paper, papyrus sheets. Yeah. Yeah, sheets of papyrus. So that, that was a real big thing then too. Um, as we mentioned before, the average uh, slave had a fairly simple and meager diet, um, largely consisting of bread and um, locally grown vegetables um, and a bit of olive oil. Um, probably if their masters uh, were ever invited to the local temple by one of the patrons or something, maybe, just maybe, some form of um, food might have been taken back home to them to the, um, the family house but where the, the slaves might have eaten of it. But um, for the most part, you'll find that uh, 90 to 95 percent of the diet in the ancient times people was pretty well vegetarian. Uh, although, when I say vegetarian, I mean that includes uh, eating dairy products. So, the actual presence of veganism. So, here we go. Uh, where do you think that might have been and when? Anybody have a guess? Oh, come on, guys. Pythagoras. Pythagoras. Bingo. All right. We'll go, we'll go to some of this stuff here a little bit later. Um, yeah. So, 6th century BC, uh, Pythagoras of Samos. We chiefly know about Pythagoras from the writings of Diogenes Laertius. Um, and incidentally, you can read all of this for free on the internet. Just Google it. And it's in English, too. Wow, I love that. Um, what we know about Pythagoras is uh, written by uh, more contemporary people who probably uh, frosted the cake a little bit. They probably um, idealized his story a bit. Uh, what we do know about Pythagoras is that he's a person who traveled a bit. Uh, the, the accounts say that he was initiated in the mystery schools in Egypt and that he also went to the land of the Chaldeans and to the Persians and studied there. So he was a very learned man. Um, he went back to Italy. He uh, was an, unfortunately um, pestered by the local people so much that he left uh, his uh, city of residence and moved to um, the ball of the foot of Italy, to a place called Crotona. And there in Crotona they liked him. And so they started sort of a brotherhood of Pythagoras. Um, we now call it the, the Pythagorean school, but it's hard to say whether it was an actually, actually a school or an academy. Um, we know a little bit about uh, people who considered themselves four or five hundred years later Neo-Pythagoreans. Now, Pythagoras was the person who postulated that everything in the universe could be rendered down to numbers. And that um, everything is based on number and, and geometrical relationship and ratio. Uh, including music. So we have our modern musical scale probably thanks to Pythagoras who, because back then there were a lot of different scales of music and, and people appreciated uh, uh, musical dissonance whereas we, we don't really like that too much anymore. Uh, if any of you have ever listened to recreations of Byzantine music you know what dissonance sounds like when it's, when it's planned. <laughs> and it's supposed to have some sort of musical function. Um, but Pythagoras is the one that we can credit for uh, the modern uh, musical scale. Uh, supposedly in his academy, for instance, uh, people would come, it was something like a monastery, uh, we might understand it, or uh, his school had several years to go through. And the first, the first step in entering the, the Pythagorean school was a, a vow of silence, a person uh, made an agreement not to speak for a period of three years. The other notable thing, of course, is that Pythagoras advocated ab abstaining from all animal products. And not only that, he also advocated uh, a very careful choice of uh, vegetables. 
So for Pythagoras, he didn't eat root vegetables or, or things that grew below the ground. And also, weren't there severe punishments for anyone who ate a bean because beans were thought to resemble Beans were a problem. Uh, be beans were a problem because they caused flatulence. And flatulence, uh, seriously, uh, for, for the ancients, flatulence was uh, uh, often considered to be, how, how would you call it, uh, kind of like... Uh, Demonic, impure, impure, and demonic, and uh, and whatnot. So, uh, you know, if you're having flatulence, there's something wrong with you. There, there's some disagreeable uh, uh, thing going on with you, in your philosophically or spiritually. So, yeah, he didn't eat beans, and he didn't eat uh, root vegetables. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, they weren't having yams or potatoes. There's a sort of new world uh, vegetables. And no, there was only one kind years. of uh, there's only one kind of old world bean, and that's a fava beans. Mm -hmm. You know, who likes fava beans? Mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of tough skin. Yeah, they are. But actually, there's a green dish called fava that's made from peas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know about something in their legumes? No, I don't know. I I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Ezekiel bread, didn't they use some lentils in the bread? Yeah, there was lentils there. Um, I, it's it's a modern day recreation, but we'll get to the Essenes uh, in a little bit and what they were doing, and and I'm here to deflate your balloon about the Essenes. Um, what are we doing on time? Do we have time? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know. Yeah, we have we have quite a bit of time. I, I don't want to keep you guys here all night. I can, I can, I can talk. We do this interactively. You sure. as a talk and then a Q and A, but we can just. Cool. Let, cool. Let's so just keep going the way we are. All right, that's, that's good. So, um, yeah, so uh, uh, Pythagoras had specific cosmo uh, world views or cosmologies that um, dictated the way he saw uh, the choice of, of um, particular things within the diet. You know, like beans and tubers, they were off limits. Um, curiously enough, though, the same idea would repeat itself with the Manichaeans hmm. and, the, and uh, their descendants like the Bogomils and the Paulicians and then finally the Cathars. Who were vegetarians? The Cathars were vegetarians, yes, hmm. and uh, the Bogomils, the Paulicians, the Manichaeans. We'll get to them too. Um, So, we've already discussed about the Egyptian elite as being vegetarians. Um, it probably has something to do. I mean, you ask yourself, I mean, apart from Egypt's um, commerce with India and the intellectual commerce that happened in almost in prehistory, probably, you have to ask yourself, well, why else would they be um, rejecting uh, the eating of animals? And, if you look at their pantheon, you can readily see why. I mean, most of the animals within Egyptian life were uh, somehow sacred to them as symbols of particular gods. So you don't you don't eat your god well, unless, of course, you're a Christian. Um, I'm sorry. It's, a, it's one of those jokes. Um, so, out of respect, you 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 don't eat. Um, the, the image, for instance, of uh, Osiris or, or uh, um, Isis, for instance. Uh, there was a lot of sacrificial killing of the animals who represented the gods, but they were, like you said, they were mummified. And yeah, they were made into mummies. And, and they weren't eaten personally. A mummy, is a, very, a mummy is a very complex idea in Egyptian re religion. And I, I can't get into it too much tonight because it's... There's a lot that's involved with that, yeah. but it's a it's kind of like a magical technology in which they're trying to uh, bring together the invisible and the visible worlds, and and there's all kinds of things that are going on there that they're doing. Um, they may have killed some of the animals, probably, but uh, on the, in another sense, many of the animals that we find mummified probably died also of natural causes. Um, what is interesting is that a lot of the pharaohs, when they died, uh, they interred their slaves with them. So you, you know that they strangled them. They usually strangled them. 
the slaves to. Later on, they found out that they could uh, uh, make ushamtis to represent the slaves and, and dispense with all the killing. <laughs> so I like ushamtis, they're cool. Where else? An ushamti is a figurine made out usually out of faience um, to represent a servant or to represent uh, different kinds of people in the Pharaoh's life. And they were brought to life by inscribing them with the, uh, with the Egyptian writing to, to say what they are and what they do. And so the Egyptian priests or priestesses would um, activate the Ushaptis through uh, rituals in the temples, usually by uh, using the Owas scepter and uh, with um, spells and invocations. And so, and then they would install the Ushaptis. It wasn't uncommon for um, some of the graves that we uh, have uh, excavated to find like a thousand Ushaptis. So the, uh, the Pharaoh would have all of those servants in the afterlife that would be there to greet him and to take care of him or her. So, rather than killing a thousand people. Rather than killing a thousand people, which was a a terrible waste of money to them back then as they look at it, or wealth or power. Um, so, here's something out of the blue. Do you know that we almost went into uh, an industrial revolution during the ancient world? How many are aware of that? Yes. I know that uh, some some ancient Greek engineers came up with the first steam machine. For you. Mm -hmm. That's Heron of Alexandria. He um, he wrote about it and developed the first steam turbine in 64 A.D. And what did he develop it for? Do you remember? I'm no. I I, I remember seeing some something developed. It 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 didn't, it didn't have some kind of. Um, it didn't have any real applications, it was more of a curiosity than mm. anything I remember. Well, incidentally, uh, most, of the, most of the fabulous inventions that Heron uh, developed in his life and that he carefully recorded uh, and made illustrations from were uh, wonder machines, uh, little wonder devices to be put in temples to wow and, and uh, uh, make afraid the, uh, the common <laughs> worshippers. He invented ways of making thunder in the eaves of temples. He invented uh, uh, mechanisms that could open doors magically without hands. He invented uh, uh, statues that could move and talk. And he also invented uh, holy water dispensers that took token or coins, right? So you could go into the temple and you could put your coin into the slot and it would go through and there'd be a movement in the machine and there'd be a dispenser and you'd get a cup of the sacred waters of Osiris or Isis to, to wash your, your eyes and your ears and your mouth and your hands before you went into the temple. Uh, but he also developed this steam turbine as a, as a component in one of the other wonder machines used for the, the temple purposes to basically to deceive and scare the crap out of the ordinary worshippers. You know, to Wasn't there also a, a, a very intricate uh, mechanism that, that charted the movement of the solar system? Uh, well, there is the Antikythera mechanism mm -hmm. that was that was recovered in the, in the Aegean Sea um, some years ago, and it's one of the most. It's an analog computer, is what it is, and it charts the um, um, uh, the movement of the planets and the movement of the constellations. It, basically, it's a navigational computer. Um, so, um, they think that, they estimate that this uh, was, was made by, oh, it just slipped right out of my mind, the guy who invented the, the notion of the fulcrum, Archimedes. They think that Archimedes may have made that personally, or one of the students of Archimedes. Um, I don't know. I've seen reproductions of it, it's really cool. And if you want to, you can go on the, the web and see uh, History Channel. Uh, they've done a, a couple specials on the Antikythera. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's awesome. It's what it is. It's just awesome. 
So, I mean, between the antikythera mechanism and between the, the steam turbine of Heron, which was completely held back because no one realized, hey, we could build a bigger one and it could power our mills. Because they were using water mills then to power machinery that they made. We found where they had a stone cutting and were using uh, powered uh, saw, metal, metal saws, for instance, in, uh, in Jordan. Uh, we, we know that it could be nothing else other than a mechanized uh, sawing um, kind of machine. Um, yes? Um, I'm not quite sure it's something I just created recently. Um, an automaton made of wooden piece of string. Uh, so, so it's something that move around you with programmed movements and events. And you just let it go. Yeah. I think there's either Greek or Egyptian, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, that, they were very interested in, in making automatons. There were uh, several, several, several versions of automatons. Um, like Heron of Alexandria made several kinds of automatons that were mostly used in temple settings. Um, it's interesting that the people that were paying him to do all of these wonderful things and develop things were priesthoods. And, and principally one of them, the, the priesthood of, of Serapis in, um, in Alexandria. So he made a lot of cool stuff for them. I mean, but you look at the inventions and you realize what could have been done with what they knew then, and you, you know that, wait a minute, we could have entered like an industrial revolution 17 or 1800 years ago, and we could have been colonizing Mars for the last thousand years. <laughs> but for one thing, and that's the, that's the imperial religion. That's what stopped it. You can call it what you want. You can say Christianity, you can call it ancient Roman religion. It doesn't really matter. It's the same thing in the end. Uh, okay, well, we said that. So let's look at some examples of, uh, of vegetarianism in, the, in antiquity. We've already mentioned the Egyptian priests and, and, and the priestesses. Um, uh, why do you think that they might have abstained? Um, from eating the flesh of animals, or even eating dairy. Well, isn't there something about Jewish law, the defilement of, of uh, mixing blood and or the wrong parts? And, and, you know, yeah, yeah, well, in, in Jewish law, for instance, it's forbidden to cook a kid in its um, own mother's milk, which has generally been interpreted in Judaism to mean that you never eat dairy products and meat products together, and you definitely don't cook them. So if you're an Orthodox Jew, you may not have a cheeseburger. But if you're a vegan, you can't have one either. Yeah. But I thought that was interesting because I, I always saw that one as, as something that could possibly have been written uh, out, of, out of sympathy for the animals because like cooking the, the baby in the mother's milk would be seen as an, ins as an insult to the mother animal and adding to the cruelty even if it was believed that to be necessary to eat meat. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, I've always sort of took it to understand that it's a, it's a tip of the hat to the respect of the mother-child relationship. Yeah. Right? Something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not an expert on Judaism, and so I won't go too much into that. However, I have some illustrations from that that we'll, we'll look at in just there, a minute. There are other, there are other uh, laws in, in the Jewish uh, legal legal uh, body that were clearly written out of compassion for the animals, like even in a eating yeah. culture, and I, I wonder about Well, the, the very, uh, the very um, uh, specifics of, the, of kashrut um, codes uh, mandates, uh, I mean, in order for something to be considered kosher, or nowadays like in Islam, halal, it means that the animal has to have been um, killed in a humane way, or the most humane way possible. And, and for kashrut uh, regulation, that means a very quick and nearly painless death, which usually is the cutting of the, mm -hmm. the quick, fast cutting of the jugular vein. Um, it's still horrendous in, in its own, but... Um, it's become even more horrible because it's all mechanized now. It's all mechanized now, and it's not, it can't be done properly. Yeah. For instance, I mean, when, when I've been told, and I, I don't know personally, but... Uh, for instance, uh, people who, who know this art, uh, the knives that they use are very, very sharp. 
and, and small. And they have a way of distracting the animal by touching them on the neck where it is. And then, and then taking the hand with the knife and rubbing across like that. And when the animal is unaware, they just feel a little sting. And, and within a minute, uh, the animal loses consciousness without really experiencing pain or suffering. But who knows about the terror of finally realizing, wait a minute, I'm about to die. Oh, yeah. You know, that's... I mean, it, it only takes a moment for yeah. your fight or flight reaction. Yeah. So you don't know. But by that, by the time that that uh, reaction sets in, it's, it's already too late. There's, the animal uh, is not going to be able to move or anything. So for, I, get, I guess from the human standpoint, it looks like it's merciful because the, the death of the animal seems to be very peaceful. Mm -hmm. um, Anyways, what I'm getting at is that there, there is something that you find in common in Mediterranean culture concerning the attitude of the gods, uh, what they think about the gods. Um, in warding off um, evil spirits and in warding off uh, evil eye and sorcery and witchcraft, it's common that in, in the Mediterranean world to make gestures that, for instance, uh, allude to uh, the sex act or generation are you know, something that we kind of think as vulgar, but to them was not. And um, if you think about it for a minute, you say, well, why is that? Why, why would that be? What's the big deal? And the fact about it is, is that uh, in the mindset of, of the Romans and the Greeks in particular, uh, the gods were terrified of anything having to do with generation. They were terrified of the sex act. They were terrified of the process of birth, and they were terrified of death, of human death. So these things, and everything pertaining to them, could not be associated with the gods or with the worship of gods, or with ritual specialists, those priests and priestesses who served the gods in the temples, um, from the human side. Now from another side, I mean many of the gods and goddesses did not accept um, any kind of like animal sacrifices. Um, and so the, usually the people uh, that were associated as ritual specialists with these deities quite often were vegetarians also. And, and the reason was the idea of uh, impurity. Uh, there's, a, there's another word for that. Ritual impurity. We'll just say ritual impurity. So a ritual specialist is a person who is, is uh, dedicated in their lives in a particular way to be at the beck and call for the service of the god or the goddess and um, to be prepared at all times. And uh, one of the ways of being preparing uh, or to be prepared is to separate oneself away from things that defile, defilements. Yeah. Um, why were the gods terrified of reproduction and generation and death? Anybody have, anybody have a guess? Because they're immortal. <laughs> they are immortal, and they were uh, in the minds of the yeah in the minds of the Mediterranean people. Uh, the gods were maybe afraid that they might fall into a human birth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't blame them. <laughs> Isn't there also a tendency of like the children of gods to like kill the fathers also? Oh yeah, Oedipus. Yeah, <laughs> like, basically you do it as well. Yeah, Oedipus. And then there's Electra. That's another issue. So. But it makes sense they'd be afraid of falling into a human existence because the line between a human world and the divine was a lot thinner in that it, context. It, it I was mean, because humans became gods all the time and. Yeah. Well, they became gods uh, with, with public knowledge from about the time of, in the first century BC when apotheosis was understood to be yeah. possible for people who weren't emperors, right? Like, um, I mean, who's the first... Uh, I think that's part of the origin of early Christianity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The... Um, well, there, there's, a, there's a text, for instance, in, um, um, in the New Testament. It's called Second Peter, the letter, the epistle of Second Peter. And it talks about people participating in the divine nature. And if you look into the, the Greek text and you begin to look for corollaries 
in, in uh, literature of that time, you realize that it's an illusion to um, um, epigraphic memorials, for instance, uh, having to do with the apotheosis of, of the emperors or of very prominent people. Um, and it's to be made permanent or to be made immortal in the memory by having your name and your deeds engraved in stone, uh, at least as a public work, which is the word uh, liturgia, which we get this modern word liturgy, the liturgia, the public work. So in the, in the public work or the mind, the arena of, of public awareness, one is apotheosized. You know, they're made immortal because their name and their deeds have been written in stone. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, next we get to the Essenes. Uh, how many have heard about the Essenes before? How many have eaten Essene bread, Ezekiel bread? I have, yeah. How many of you guys have made it at home? <laughs> uh, it's pretty cool, actually, when you make it. It's, uh, I don't, what you get is not like what you get at the store. Um, how many of you heard that the Essenes were vegetarians? Yeah? Do you think it's true? No? How about you, Paul? I'm trying to remember what, uh, what Keith Akers told us a few months ago. I think he complicated it for us, at least. Yeah? yeah. That's good. What did he say? Ah, oh, that's... Uh, I remember him discussing the Essenes, but I, I, I think he did say that they were vegetarians. Did? I, I think he did say that they were vegetarians. Oh, did he? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it is complicated. Um, but I imagine it's more complex than that. They rejected the uh, sacrifices um, in the temple in Jerusalem um, because they rejected the priesthood there. Uh, the Essenes were a competing uh, ritual system. They considered themselves to be the only true successors to um, the, uh, the entire uh, Judaic uh, ritual cult. And because of the, um, the Hasmonean high priesthood, who were not Jews, but converted and took over the high priesthood in, in Jerusalem, they considered them to be, well, not, not only just for that reason, but also for the reason of their collusion with the Roman Empire. They considered them to be uh, invalid and to be interlopers. So the Essenes went and set up this alternative community um, in Qumran, and not only in Qumran, but we have the archaeological remains in Qumran, and of course we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, these texts that have been recovered from caves. Yes. Did you, did you raise your hand? No. All right, okay. Um, so for many years, uh, we considered, well, they were vegetarians, and there was even like a modern Essene Brotherhood uh, that cropped up some years ago under a guy named Edmund Zeckley. Have you ever heard of Edmund Zeckley? And so he promoted uh, vegetarianism and uh, uh, hygienic practices and mucusless diets and things like that, and uh, uh, based it upon the authority of the Essenes and translated Essene texts, which we've never been able to find original text to, to support that. But apparently, uh, living in the desert of Qumran, uh, uh, these Essenes did subsist on a largely vegetarian diet. However, we have found evidence that they are they're of a paschal lamb. Uh, several of them. I mean, we found lamb bones there at the Qumran community. So they did at least uh, have lamb during their Pascha, Passover, um, at least for some years. Now, there, uh, the connection is often made uh, between the Essenes and the early Christian movement, and uh, there's probably a lot of truth to that, although it's hard to say just how far you can go with that. So I won't, I won't get into that too much then. Yes? But, uh, the lamb, I mean, as, when they had the Passover, was it like a punishment? Well, they were supposed to go into the land of milk and honey, right? Yeah. Was yeah. it like a punishment to eat animal products, or was it like a gift? Well, you know, we, we get back to this uh, blood thing, this fixation on the blood, because according to the Exodus story, um, Moses commanded the, the, um, the Hebrew people living in Egypt to, to paint 
uh, blood on their the lintels of their doors, so that this angel of death, uh, this this Azrael who would pass over the land of Egypt, would pass them by. Uh, so it harkens it harkens back to that, and it harkens back to the to the instructions to eat what's called a, a seder meal, which is a meal that's prepared in such a way that you're about to leave in a very hurried manner. Uh, so you're eating very simple things. You're eating unleavened bread. You're eating bitter herbs. You're eating lamb. Um, and all of it is though you're ready at any moment to grab everything on the table and run. So it's an idea of travel and of movement and, and an idea of being saved from, from death. Um, could it have been fear of making the Egyptians fear the blood by spreading all this blood? Well, you know, that, that, it's interesting you mention that. I, I'm sure it must have been really disgusting to the Egyptians to, to see blood painted on the door cells, but and it wouldn't be to any one of us now. <clears throat> so, I mean, if it really happened, it's probably more symbolical than anything. It's, it's hard to say. Um, of, of, the, of the different branches of Judaism 2,000 years ago, we do know something about one group called the Therapeutia. Uh, anybody ever hear of them? The Therapeutia? Philo of Alexandria wrote about the, the Therapeutia um, uh, as a sort of brother or sister community that connected to the Essenes. Now, the Therapeutia obviously living in Egypt, were also included women. And the Therapeutia were noted to be vegetarians, so we know that they were vegetarians. Um, there's one group right there uh, that we can definitely identify. Um, and then there's, uh, there's been a lot of talk about, well, what about this historical Jesus? Wasn't he a vegetarian? He was an Essene, wasn't he? Well, he may have been. Um, he may not have been, uh, if he existed historically, that is. Uh, definitely he would have known these people, and there would have been travel between the various uh, communities or brother houses of, of the Essene communities, the Therapeutia and Alexandria, the Qumran community going into Jerusalem and Galilee and these different areas. However, um, you know, there is the, the one... Um, passage that's um, contained in, I guess, the, the Gospel according to John, that is a post-resurrectional cameo in which Jesus is recorded to have eaten fish with the apostles on, on the Sea of Galilee. So that's the one notable exception. If you wish to make a case for Jesus as an exemplar of the um, of vegetarianism, you have to take that into account. Other than that, and also, and also, uh, he could have. And also, he, when he ate the, the Passover the Passover seder, it probably contained lamb. My yeah, it's very. And likely. also, the people will say, "Oh, but he couldn't have been a vegetarian because he multiplied the fish." But last week, Paul made the argument that by multiplying the fish, he could have caused less animal deaths, and it could be like the first tofurkey. <laughs> Tofurky. Yeah. Yeah. Tofishy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so Jesus and the Essenes. Now, where does it all come from? Well, it comes from the text. And so, where is. Uh, yes? Uh, yeah, after he rose from the dead, that's the only time to prove, not out of necessity, he ate fish. Just to prove that he was To prove that he was alive and yeah. there, right? That's the only time it says the Bible, from what I gathered. That, that's a good argument. That's, that's consistent with uh, early uh, patristic interpretation of it, too. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if, um, if any of you have ever read like the Old Testament, like Genesis, then, and if you uh, read it carefully, you realize that in the uh, prelapsarian era, before in the narrative, Adam and Eve fall from their um, exalted state, um, that they were vegans. And in fact, um, in several places, as it, as it falls when you read the Torah, um, you realize that um, 
humans eating uh, the flesh of animals is something that only happened after the, the Great Flood, according to the narrative. Everyone knew that, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I knew you did because uh, when I was uh, first a vegetarian, I guess when I was 15 or 16, they were talking about that in all the magazines. And yet the flood is interpreted as a punishment for the evils of the people. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, it's, uh, there's another incidental thing. If you look at the texts carefully, you, you read the generations from Adam and all, and you read how long they live, and then you read up to the flood, and immediately after the flood, so they're eating animals that are supposedly clean, and immediately they no longer live long. <laughs> Methuselah lived almost 900 years. <laughs> but uh, this, uh, the sons of, uh, of Noah, and, well, the sons of the sons of Noah are only living 120 years, or even less. <laughs> That's interesting, you know. I mean, whether or not you think the, uh, the narrative is a symbolical narrative or a highly idealized story or whatever it is, um, that's an interesting little uh, piece of information there. Could it have been that Noah was given the opportunity to eat animals, but he didn't? It was only him that was allowed to eat animals, not everybody else at Noah's time. Oh, well, after, after, the, he, after the flood. He, 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 so, he would take care of the animals. Yeah. So after the flood, supposedly uh, the, the boat landed on Ararat and they, they deport from the boat and and the, the voice says, you know, make the sacrifice of the clean animals, and now you may eat from these clean animals. And, and uh, so, who are those on the boat? Well, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons, right, and their wives. So, what, there's eight people supposedly alive, according to the story. And, um, and then after that... Maybe just give Noah the... Who's to say? Who's to say? Because you know, take care of the animals. Yeah, who's to say? It's, it's, it's hard to say. I hope he waited until the animals had babies. That would be really fun if he had them on the ark and then they landed and then he... Well, sure it doesn't make very much sense to preserve all of these animals. Yeah. Then, you know, and you're on a boat for like yeah, the point? better part of a year and then you get off on a high mountain. Okay, let's kill some. <laughs> doesn't make sense. But, uh, so we have the, the narrative from Eden in which um, human beings in the Garden of Eden are frugivores. They eat fruit. And they continue to be vegans until another kind of fall, uh, a cataclysmic change of the world. And the world is changed in, in other kinds of ways. And, uh, and then there is a, an edict uh, in Genesis where the Elohim, uh, Elohim say, and now the span of man's life shall be, you know, what is it, four score and however many years or whatever it is. I, I don't remember. It's been years since I looked at it. Um, but the limit's 120 years. And so from there on the story is, you know, people don't live very long anymore and there's disease. Um, but at least in the, in the Judaic tradition, you see episodes that tell you that there's a connection between diet and holiness and it's always a vegetarian diet. For instance, so when you look at the narrative of the Exodus, so the Israelites have gone out of Egypt, they've crossed the Red Sea, they're out in the wilderness, and they have no food. And what is it that they eat? Come on, Sunday school people, you know. Manna. manna. They're eating manna that, that rains down from the skies every day and is collected. What's that? Little flakes. Little white flakes. Of what? Off of something, right? <laughs> it's basically their equivalent of nutritional yeast. Yeah. Yeah. Nutritional yeast. So they're they're living on mana. According to the story, they're they're living on mana for how many years? Forty. Forty years. That's right. Another real symbolical number. But the thing about it is, is that it's not meat, and it tastes like whatever they want it to taste like, but it doesn't taste like meat because. What do they start to fuss about? The flesh pots of Egypt. Um, further on in, in, the, uh, in the Judaic tradition, we have the story of Daniel, um, who 
refused to eat the meats that were given to him because they were sacrificed to idols, right? So he's only eating the cool word there, usually in, in English, is pulse. What is pulse? That's like lentils and beans. Lentils and beans and green vegetables, right? He also refused the wine. He refused the wine, mm -hmm. yeah, because it was poured out to the gods. Mm -hmm. um, you can see once again the rebellion against the, against the, the government and the state religion. Uh, and then there's the other thing too, uh, yes, please. I'm just curious, do rabbis generally agree that vegetarianism had a deep root in Judaism? Some do. Yeah. Most don't. But uh, if, they, if they know their religion well, why would they not agree? Or they interpret it in different ways? Can, can yeah. there be other ways to interpret it? Well, there's different schools of interpretation, and there's also different kinds of cultures in Judaism. There's, Judaism is not a monoculture by any means. I mean, you have, you know, you have uh, uh, Ashkenazis, you have Reform Jews, you have Sephardim, you have Middle Eastern Jews, and they have their, their traditional culture, you know, and their traditional kind of culinary stuff. And people always make justification for what they like. Everyone does. So, um, so the, the, the Nazarites, the Nazarite vow is another incidence that you can find from the Judaic context in which there is an abstention from anything uh, that has touched death. And obviously, if you can't have anything that's touched death, you can't eat the flesh of animals. So Nazarites are, are uh, this vegan uh, image of, of, of religious righteousness or holiness. Yes? Wasn't Jesus a Nazarene? Well, they, they say he was, and in the Middle East and in Arabic, uh, Christians are called Nazarene. So, it may be. Uh, there are early texts that uh, identify communities um, in Palestine and in Syria uh, as Nazarene. So, there is a connection. But exactly how that connection works out, we're not really sure. Just to return to Daniel for a second, I interest in the narrative about him being thrown to the lions and the lions mysteriously suddenly becoming tame and being given bread to sustain them. That just seems like a very odd way to tell the story. This idea of being thrown to the lions and and then, and then, of course, him being able to, to solve the riddle of the hand, which, which Nebuchadnezzar's yeah. wise men couldn't understand. Yeah. Well, I'm going to spoil it for you. Yeah. The, the book of Daniel is written 200 years after the events. All right. So. <laughs> and it, the Last Supper, wasn't it to, a parable to the, I guess, what do you call that? Kosher, not kosher. Oh, you mean the Seder meal? Yeah, it's, yeah it's the similar. Last Supper was bread and wine. Right? Yeah, it's sort of a... There were probably other things. Um, what's really in vogue today among uh, scholars of early Christianity is to to look at the Last Supper as a de non and symposia. In other words, to think of it as a Greco-Roman dinner party with, with toasts, with wine and toasts. Um... um I'm sort of dubious about that idea. Everyone's working on it from, from that Hellenic context and, and saying, okay, we, we have everything in operation here that was in operation with, with a, a Greco-Roman dip non, a dinner party, and you have to look at it like that. And if you do that, you get some interesting information. You realize, for instance, that Judas was one of the, uh, had one of the highest statuses among the apostles. Two, the two highest, Judas and John, the ones right next to Jesus sitting over in the corner of the, the triclinium. And, and they would have all been sitting in a triclinium, leaning on their right side, you know, laying down and eating from the plates and passing the cup around or drinking from their, from their cups. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of information that you can look, but, you know, um, the best we can tell, this, uh, this Jesus of Nazareth was, was not a uh, Hellenic in culture. And it's a, I think it's a stretch to say that they would have been uh, engaging in Hellenic uh, cultural practices or something like that. 
they, they might have been using a room that, that had a triclinium. Yeah, but he's, didn't he speak in parables? Like that's compared to the animal, rather than do animal sacrifice, that would be... Yeah, well one thing that we can be really sure of is that this, uh, uh, this Jesus of Nazareth was bitterly opposed to the temple in Jerusalem and bitterly opposed to the, to the priesthood there. All of it. He, he rejected all of it. And um, very much against that. And very much against the collusion of the, um, um, the high priesthood and the, and the Roman government. So that, that's what got him in trouble. You know, that's why they executed that man. Um, anyhow, uh, shall we uh, move on a little bit more? Any questions? It takes back to Pythagoras for a minute. I remember reading that before the term vegetarian was coined in the 1840s in England, that, what I've read, that people who followed that diet, shall we say, or lifestyle, were often called Pythagorean. That's true. That's true. Uh, it's interesting how much uh, power and influence uh, what little we know of Pythagoras has had. Um, I mean, there's, like in the world of, of Freemasonic orders, for instance, there many of them had uh, uh, Pythagorean mysteries and things, or degrees to go through. It uh, really captured the imagination of, uh, uh, of the Victorian age, for one thing. Uh, so, now Plato and, and Socrates, we don't know that they were specifically vegan or vegetarian, but we do know that they were not very enthusiastic about luxurious eating. And uh, at least in the, in the language of their day, that, that meant... That meant eating uh, meats and cheeses, um, and in fact, it um, it was um, Plato. I have it here somewhere. I'm sorry if I seem confused. It's because I am. Um, well, in the Republic, doesn't Plato his first ideal city is basically vegetarian? Yes. Yeah. 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 That's what I'm getting at. Now, Plato says that uh, the eating of uh, of flesh leads to violence and uh, is a destruction of the peace of the, of the nation. And he even, in the Republic, he even, like, he even insinuates that, that meat eating has detriment, detrimental effects on the health of the people because he says that, because originally in the ideal city they're supposed, they're supposed to be vegetarians and eat only the very basic food stuff, but then, but then uh, he says, oh, but the people are probably going to want meat to eat, but then they will need more physicians because of the problems that are caused by meat eating. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So, um, it, it seems... Talks about it, and in the Republic, it also talks about, I recall it talks about, it, okay, you, you don't want this city, so, okay, we're going to have to create, you're going to need more land, mm -hmm. you're going to have to take over other people's land, we're going to have to have armies. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> and it sort of really builds this, exactly. this aggressive society, uh, aggression against the outsiders anyway, uh, in order to sustain this meeting culture as well. How closely is he um, drawing from Pythagoras? Can we only speculate? <clears throat> well, um, Pythagoras um, really did command a, a lot of respect and attention. I mean, being a pre-Socratic uh, himself, um, the interesting thing is that whether or not there were texts in, in Plato's time, there certainly was a vivid memory uh, of the influence of Pythagoras. And uh, uh, while I don't recall the exact references right now, Plato does refer to uh, Pythagoras and Pythagoras' ideas. Um, it, I think that it is telling that some of the dominant uh, or preeminent students of Plato, such as um, uh, Xenocrates and Polemon, uh, were fierce advocates for vegetarianism. Well, that parallels the early Christianity case, where we have to speculate a little bit about Jesus of Nazareth, but I think, I, if I remember again from the key thinkers, we, we, we know with a little bit more, you know, whatever. 
And uh, so do we have that sort of siblings, maybe, or the earliest circle were yeah. uh, vegetarians? Is that right? Well, and Aristotle, uh, too, was more than likely a vegetarian. Yeah. Um, uh, certainly, he's, he does seem to say things uh, in, in various of his writings that, that do harmonize with Plato's ideas. But more telling than that is that um, uh, Aristotle's uh, successor of the uh, peripatetic school, uh, Theophrastus, was also a, a fierce supporter of vegetarianism. Um, and once again, um, the Neoplatonists in the uh, Roman Empire uh, advocated vegetarian diets. And uh, Plutarch, uh, who was a Neoplatonist and also an initiate of the uh, cult of Isis, uh, you should read about his experiences in the cult of Isis. Uh, the Golden Ass. Is, is, is one that, that refers to this. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, Plutarch was a, was a vegetarian. And another famous figure, uh, Apollonius of uh, Tyana. How many have read about him? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I, re I remember him. Uh, yeah, we had to, uh, I remember in my, my early Christianity class, we, we had to read uh, the narrative of his life in, in, in comparison with the Gospel of Mark. Yeah. Uh, makes you wonder, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who's copying who? Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really hard to say because also there there's evidence that it's generally accepted that Apollonius of Tyana lived in the first century AD, mm -hmm. but there's also another Apollonius of Tyana from second century BC, and we don't know which is which. But uh, generally, Apollonius of Tyana is thought to have lived in the first century AD and, and have, to have come from Cappadocia. And that's also very important because Cappadocia was a region that later on had a profound influence in uh, Christianity and the Byzantine Empire. Um, so, so we have Plutarch, we have um, Porphyry. Porphyry was uh, also an important Neoplatonist who was a vegetarian. Evidently, everyone who was a Neoplatonist was a vegetarian, as far as I've been able to find. Uh, if they're famous and they were Neoplatonists, they were vegetarians. Uh, do we, do we know if I'm wrong, somebody tell me one of these days so I'll know, okay? But it sure looks that way. Um, do we know what Augustine thought about vegetarians? He was a Neoplatonist. Uh, yeah, for a while. He probably, I mean, he I was mean, a... Even, even his Christian theology is heavily Neoplatonic. He yeah. says that the Neoplatonists are closest to Christianity. His theology is two things. It, it, it has a little bit of, it does have a little bit of Neoplatonic influence, but more than anything, the whole warp of it has been colored by his association with the Manichaeans. Yes. We'll get yes. to the Manichaeans in a minute if, if you want. The Manichaeans, are, they were all vegetarians too, the Manichaeans. And they're kind of like a, so have, a syncretic been... New Age Christian uh, version of things, uh, Gnostic uh, sort of. So maybe he was a vegetarian originally. He he probably was a vegetarian most of his life. He was a real ascetical man. He really punished himself and punished the <laughs> oh, yeah. the flesh and all of that. So uh, it was commonly known in that day and age that meat, uh, if you ate meat, it would make you um, prone to violence and stimulate the passions, and for men, uh, produced lots and lots of semen. So, yeah, well, I think it's going to call it the way it is. And this was a no-no uh, for not just Christians, but, but Stoics and uh, Cynics and Peripatetics and, and all of these who wanted to have self-control. In order to have self-control, to live a peaceful and, and good life and to appreciate, um, you know, the, the essential things that are that have value in life, one had to have self-control and they couldn't be swayed by the animal passions. And there was another idea that, and some people say that it goes back to Pythagoras, that the consuming of animals is, mere, is, is an intimate act of communing and taking in the substance and the nature of the animal itself. Mm -hmm. In other words, on an energetic level or on a level of like the vital or life force that you are consuming the life force of that animal and their consciousness too. So when you do that, you're grafting 
uh, an, uh, a non-human kind of consciousness into yourself, which then becomes an impediment to the philosophical life. But, but that's still based on a very negative view of the animal. Well, no, not necessarily. Um, maybe not as higher view as what we have, but I, at least on, on the real world practical side of, of the praxis of philosophy or a lot, practical philosophy, they felt, um, and, and you can be sure that they felt this through a continuous um, kind of community of experience over a long period of time by, by practical experiments and experience and results and whatnot, that um, the consuming of animal flesh became an impediment to the living of the philosophical ideals mm -hmm. um, at, on a very, on an internal level. <clears throat> so they believed that. Whether or not we believe it, that's another thing. Um, so I was about to tell you that in, in connection to Porphyry, and you can read this, he wrote a treatise called On Abstinence from Beings with a Soul which pertains to exactly what we're talking about. Um, the consuming of the flesh of animals is also a partaking in their soul. You're taking elements or ener energetic uh, aspects of the soul into oneself. And so for the philosophers, they wanted to purify themselves. So Pope Francis claimed that animals have souls as a, have souls as a basis? Well, of course they do. At least uh, in, in, the, in the Western sort of tradition, anything that breathes has a soul because mm -hmm. the soul is like breath. Right? Yeah. 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 That's something something's developing here. It's like a, a bifurcating reaction to, to some of this very eye-opening data you're revealing to us tonight. I, I mean, some of the, some of the, the uh, vegetarians are really surprising to me, and I'm, I'm very happy on the one hand to I, 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 you know, probably have this suspicion that the Plato was a vegetarian. I thought that these were. Did I run you off? No, 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 no. We oh. have to keep saying okay. things. Okay. These were um, uh, whiffs from history without much base. And I forgot about the Republic. And I forgot. So, this, so on the one hand, I'm very happy to find gladiators and Plato hand in hand <laughs> embracing this. Uh, on the other hand, and this is which is just what's just become conscious to me. It's, Frustrating, and it reminds me of what's going on right now. Where, oh, Denzel Washington is vegetarian now. Oh, and then you read about why, and it's like, oh, I did it for the planet, and I did it for my health. I feel better since I did it, and not one will just say what I seems to be the sensible reaction, which is, I just thought maybe it would be. It's not nice to kill the innocent or something like that. Like no one, no one, like the child's reaction seems to be the most sensible, which will just put their hand over their mouth and whore and cry and say, mommy, tell that man to put the knife down near the nice animal. Exactly. And so there's this kind of insanity. And there seems to be a bit of species in this planet. what I call philosophical narcissism. There's that, like, yes. It's, 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 like yeah. I don't want to eat animals yeah. because it's going to impede my, my philosophical path. It just shows you how fallen this world is, that even the noblest souls who are embracing this very important change don't seem to be able to nail like what's the fundamental reason for doing it. It's like there's this pervasive insanity in this world, and so even the Plato's and they're like, oh, well, you're going to have to get more land if you do that, and there's more doctors, and it just... The reason it's wrong is the most obvious thing in the world, in a way. If you just, if you, that it's wrong, you know, it's, it's like the... What's that? The line test? Yeah. Oh, I guess line A is the... I guess everyone's saying line A is longer than line B. I guess line A must be longer than line B. It's like there's something like that going on in this world. And it goes back to... I, I just don't think the ancients are different enough from us. Like, They're like, not. I mean, and I, I, fact, I, like, I like Julian James, but I, I just... Even, even this is all post... Uh, so one of the points I wanted anyway. to make to you guys is that the, the, the ancient Greco-Roman world was so much like us that it's shocking. I mean, they almost went through an industrial revolution. And if they had, we we might be having this meeting on Mars right now, on capital helium, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, you know, or we might be colonizing Alpha Centauri at this moment. 
we would have been way ahead. Uh, but on the other hand, we probably would have still destroyed the planet yeah. uh, to do it. We climate change earlier. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I think that these very great men, probably they're at a very great disadvantage because we're talking 2,000 years, 2,500 years, and we have very little of what they said or spoke. I think they would have cared about the animals. Is I think Pythagoras would. Evidence? Is there any writings or... Well, they cared about people. They, they certainly cared about um, uh, disenfranchised people. You know, I, that gives me reason to think that they would care about the innocence of animals. Certainly, uh, Pythagoras and, and uh, Plato understood the sentience of animals. I th thought I read somewhere that Pythagoras believed in reincarnation. Pythagoras so certainly did believe in transmigration. transmigration. And, uh, it was a common belief. Plato did too. It that's was very last, common. That's and the last chapter of the Republic. Yes. And I mean, and Alexander the Great brought his gurus from, from India, and they most definitely believed that uh, all of us have uh, had many, many lives, and we've been animals, and we've been maggots, and we've been flies, <laughs> and we've been elephants and dolphins. And but is there a sense of hierarchy? You know what? The Greeks did have a sense of hierarchy about that. Uh, there were some schools that felt that once you got to be human, you would never go to a lower birth. Mm -hmm. But even in Hinduism, oh, yeah. there's this hope for not having a lower birth. And in Buddhism, that believes in transmigration, they're always hoping to, to live a life of, of purity and righteousness so that you don't have a lower birth in case you don't achieve enlightenment mm -hmm. in this life. Um, so, well, so the, there, there's another stream, and this is the hidden stream. This is the Manichaeans. Um, but before I get to that, oh, yeah. So I wanted to mention an interesting thing. Um, we know that uh, Plotinus and uh, Porphyry and, and, uh, uh, were, were great uh, thinkers in the Neoplatonic stream. But who, who was who their teacher was? Does anybody offhand know? His name was Ammonius Saccas in Alexandria. And interestingly enough, one of the, one of the fellow students of um, Plotinus was a man named Origen of Alexandria. Um, Ammonius Saccas, uh, that last name Saccas, is a... Um, uh, a Grecized version of Sakya, and, and his family were, was from India, and he was trained in the, uh, the uh, Vedantic schools also. So here is a Vedantic scholar and a scholar of, of Neoplatonism teaching in his school in Alexandria. He's teaching Origen of Alexandria, the greatest of the, the church fathers. He's teaching Plotinus and several others. And so here is the basis. Once again, we go back to India. We find in, in the Indus Valley this origin of a respect for all life because we're all in it together. We're all actually one. And the, the, through the, the, the appearance of samsara, we are being born and dying and living and returning again as many different kinds of creatures. So you don't kill your father or your mother just because your father or mother appears to be a cow or a goat now. Yes? Um, but isn't the uh, like letdown from our perspective about like, uh, the worship of the cow in India, I guess, I guess, it, I guess that sort of got underway like, contemporaneously with... Alexander or something like that, is that right? Well, um, the sacred cow of India, I, I didn't, honestly... Didn't that arise out of the fact that it was, like, the, that the cow was at utility? It may have, but I, I really don't know about the social circumstance of um, how that came about. Um, uh, wasn't uh, the, the vegetarianism of the Roman class? Was it wasn't that a reaction to early Jainism and early Buddhism? 
put the, the teaching of nonviolence in both of those traditions, and, and both of those traditions rejected the caste system as well as the as, as well as the slaughter of animals. Exactly. Right. Exactly. What I, what I recently read though was that Jainism and Buddhism, like, were they developed like in a historical context where. Uh, the cow was needed to, uh, like there was, there was a, it was prescribed prescription against slaughtering cows just based on the fact that uh, they were needed to. Yeah. Well, I have, I have read about that before and it, it seems very reasonable to me that yeah. that's probably behind it. Um, the historical man, the Buddha, um, Siddhartha Gautama, um, it's very likely that um, he and one of the, the great saints of Jainism, Mahavira, um, probably met because they were alive at the same time and they were living in, a, in, in nor both in northern India. So uh, the similarities between Buddhism and Jainism are probably no accident at all. Um, Buddha was uh, a very interesting person in how he saw the social problems of his day because as you said he rejected the caste system but he also categorically rejected the uh, uh, the Vedic uh, Brahmanic priesthood and the entire um, repertoire of, of um, sacrifices the uh, um, uh, what do they call them? The pujas and the um, mm -hmm. and then the burnt sacrifices. The fire sacrifices. Uh, what's that called? It's not a puja. Arshti. It's what? Arti. 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 No, I'm thinking of another. It'll come to me. But uh, there's there's the offerings and then there's the uh, there are the things that are burnt. I mean, they they use agni. Agni. Fire god. Yeah, it's um, um, they use agni as the means of transferring. The offerings to the to the gods, um, for the most part, uh, you know, we don't tend to think that they uh, used animals as, as burnt offerings, but um, they may have. You, know, you you guys have heard about the recent sacrifice in uh, in Nepal, yeah, like the and then the earthquake. That's that's interesting. Um, but they do that every year, right? And there's yeah, like thousands and thousands of animals slaughtered for that. It's horrible. Yeah. Um, yeah, the fire tiger price is Yajna. Yajna, that's yeah. it. Yeah, Yajna. Yeah, I couldn't remember that. It's strange. So, um, oh, we were going to get to the Manichaeans. So, uh, how many of you guys have read about the Manichaeans? I know you have. I'm sure you have, Paul? So, so Mani was, was, a, was a man who uh, was born in, in Persia in the early 3rd century. And, uh, so one of these people with, that had a lot of visions, apparently, and he came to uh, um, consider himself uh, to be um, an embodiment or an incarnation of um, the, the Holy Spirit of the Christians. And his idea was that both uh, Christianity uh, and, and Buddhism and Zoroastrianism were incomplete, and so his visions were meant to be the completion of these. Um, and so he started. Um, um, a school there in, in the Persian uh, region that uh, that grew and had a great deal of influence. At one time, it was a, a competing religious movement for uh, mainline Christianity of that day, and actually was a threat. Uh, we're, we're kind of lucky that some of the some of the texts have, have survived today. It's, it's very it's really fascinating. But Augustine himself was was a Manichaean for something like 10 years before he uh, made his trip to Rome to become a teacher of, uh, of rhetoric. Um, and you could still see traces of this, uh, of this Manichaean mm -hmm. dualism in his thinking, his hatred of, of the, the, the fleshiness of being, you know, and of, of be actually being a human being in a real world. <laughs> he hates all of that. He gets that from Manichaeanism. But the Manichaeans were real vegetarians, and in fact, um, it seems that they were vegans, at least uh, the ones who took vows, 
are the ones call, uh, called the electi, the elect, uh, or the, we call them the, the perfecti. Uh, the perfecti, uh, it, it usually, uh, we, we understand it, it took them a while to be able to come to the point to where they could make a, a firm dedication in their life to abstain from um, all kinds of sexual expression and love, to abstain from um, dietetic practices you know, that were common, that in other words, to become a vegan, and to, to live their life uh, in, a, in a very, very unusual way. And these people were considered um, like, I suppose like the Christians who call living saints. And both men and women had equal power uh, in the Manichaean communities. But what's important about the Manichaeans is that uh, this dream of Manichaeanism or this Gnostic dualism, kind of syncretic Christian, Zarathustrian idea, um, embedded itself in certain areas in Christianity. Uh, for instance, the, the Paulicians uh, kind of appeared a few centuries later in Byzantine life. And, and cause problems, and, and um, one of their leaders was banished and went uh, to the north into Bulgaria, um, and is obviously the beginning of the, the movement called the Bogomils. Now the Bogomils were a little bit smarter, they wanted to uh, avoid persecution, and so they more or less went underground. And apparently, they must have been underground and propagating their ideas for quite a while because we find connections between the Bogomils and the beginning of the uh, Cathars, and, uh, and also the Albigensians in France. So the, the Cathars themselves also had the same kind of ideas about diet and about personal authenticity and about um, you know, true righteousness in, in, a, in a spiritual sense in this human life. So uh, there's enough in common between the Cathars and the Bogomils and the, and the Manichaeans to, to come to a firm conclusion that they're all related. Uh, so I don't think we need to discuss too much uh, the Jains or the Buddhists. But you can see that, um, I mean, a lot of people think that like the Greco-Roman world and the Greek philosophers are sort of like a self-contained world, but you begin to understand that there's a lot of cross-pollinization going on. There's a lot of cross-cultural dialogue and influence uh, coming in to the Greco-Roman world from from Asia, from the East. And I, I find that really fascinating. And and vice versa, from from uh, the Manichaeans, we're, we're sending apostles to China and to Mongolia uh, during their day. And we find the, the, um, the, um, the results, uh, sometimes in text, sometimes in archeological sites. And at the same time, uh, Syrian or Arabic speaking Christians were traveling into China in the sixth century. And uh, one of the schools of, of Taoism um, was actually founded by um, these uh, Syrian, Aramaic-speaking Christian monks. It, it survived as a Taoist school to this day. And we think, some people think anyways, I, I, I think so, uh, that the Tao Te Ching as a text is one of the results of the, of the Assyrian monks going to China. There's a, there's a, uh, a stone stella at the edge of Mongolia and China, uh, written, uh, half of it in Aramaic and half of it in um, some, something like a Mongolian script or Chinese script. And um, it appears that, for instance, Mongolian script, this, the, the font or the script itself, has been influenced by uh, the Aramaic writing system. But I couldn't explain too much to you about that. I'm not a specialist. Um, so
some of you might be aware, for instance, that in Eastern versions of Christianity, like the um, or, uh, Orthodox and Oriental churches, that um, everyone is required to be a vegan 51% of the year. Did you know that? The fasting regulations. Um, there, are, there are periods of fasting that are required that don't, do not allow for animal products whatsoever. And uh, the other thing is that by tradition, in the monastic lives, uh, the nuns and the monks, when they, when they go into the monasteries and they go through their preliminary period, and when they are finally uh, ordained into to the monastic life, they are, from that time on, they no longer eat meat. Uh, although they're allowed to have cheese once in a while. The, the Orthodox. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do we know about the um, non-Orthodox dietary habits of the monks? Well, um, in Catholicism, there, there used to be uh, these different kinds of rules uh, about eating and abstention from, from meat products. Uh, um, just, I, I guess in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, you know, the big thing was like fish on Fridays, you know. Uh, abstain from things with blood, but some fish have blood, you know. I guess most fish do. Uh, I don't know. Is this the beginning of the idea that fish are animals? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, I do know one of, uh, one of the things that goes back to antiquity is that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians, Oriental Christians, are allowed to eat um, seafood that's not fish, um, and it's not considered uh, ruled by, uh, because back in the day, some some of the people considered all that stuff unclean and garbage. So the early Christians would, would eat the things that uh, other people wouldn't consider. What about beavers? According to the Catholic Church, a beaver is a fish. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I suppose. Well, what about a platypus? Uh, I don't know, but apparently, the apparently the, the capybara is considered a, a fish by the Roman Catholic Church hmm. because the capybara is an aquatic mammal. Yeah. So what otters then too? So the uh, nickel is an ichthus. Hmm? The nickel is an ichthus. Interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And it's probably a misinterpretation from Jesus, Jesus spoke in parables, and Peter couldn't understand the parables. So, so that's why when he multiplied the fish, he tried to get him away, he just so he didn't understand. Well, it, it so that happens. was the only language he could speak to Peter. It so happens that he um, was a fisherman. We were talking about origin. Origin and really enjoyed um, interpreting all of these texts from the point of view of, of parables and looking at um, uh, symbolic interpretations. And if you ever want to, you could read uh, what we have of Oregon, what, what is left. You could read some of his interpretations of different texts and look at how he, he looks at the symbolism that's involved, because that's all that he really cared about. Apparently, uh, in the first three or 400 years of Christianity, they didn't interpret uh, most of the, the New Testament in a literal fashion, but in a more symbolic way. And they're probably right about that. Apparently, the texts were written with the intention of them being symbolical. But except for Paul, Paul's bastard. <laughs> do, you, do you lean towards uh, a, a, a historical Jesus existence or non-existence? You're asking me? Yeah. I think it's both. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's both. Um, I think that there are it's, probably. It's Schrodinger's Jesus. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. And put him in a box or not. Yeah. Take him out of a box. Yes, he did exist. Put him in the box. No, he doesn't exist. Um, was there probably a guy named uh, Yeshua who was from Nazareth? Yeah, there probably was. And he probably was a preacher, and he probably was executed by the Romans. Um, as far as a lot of the other themes and characteristics uh, in the Gospel narratives, um, they're likely deliberately composed uh, for particular kinds of purposes and agendas. Um, 
it, one thing is certain is that the, the people that composed the gospel stories were very clear in how they wanted to use and export texts from uh, the Septuagint, from the, the Old Testament, and, and how they wanted to, to make him um, a fulfillment of messianic uh, expectation. And it's interesting that the messianic expectation that you see uh, in the Gospels is something that fulfills Alexandrian ideas, Jew Alexandrian Jewish ideas. Whereas if you look at messianic ideas of Judaism, uh, rabbinical Judaism, for instance, you're going to see a different kind of picture of a Messiah, a different kind of person that's expected. The Messiah is going to be a man and not a special spiritual man, but a man who has a charisma and a man who's going to be a, a, a war leader and lead uh, Israel in war against the world and defeat the whole world and make Israel uh, and, and the, the temple system um, the center of the world. And everyone recognizes it and everyone genuflects to this notion. But he's still just a man. Whereas the Alexandrian uh, fabrication is more in line with ideas from mystery cults of the day. So you're, those of you who have already read this, you know what, what I'm alluding to. You're going to see the same basic themes of the solar hero. You know, you're going to see the solar hero from, from the story of Talmud, the story of Bacchus and Dionysius, the story of Orpheus, the story of Osiris. You know, you can't compare all of these various narratives exactly point by point to each other, but they have enough um, uh, features in common to realize, wait a minute, we're looking at a solar hero here. And that's what you get when you look at the Gospels. You get Jesus, who as a as the Christ is uh, the Son of God, the S-U-N. <laughs> but Son. But, um... Yeah, like and, like Virgil's Eclogue. I mean, those those could all have been prophecies. Yeah, indeed. And, and when I say that, I, I, I'm not dismissing Jesus as a solar hero. Oh, he's just a solar hero. It's just a human construct. No, um, you have to you have to discover for yourself whoever Jesus is. I I, I don't have anything to say about that. Um, I neither I I don't disbelieve in Jesus. So. I don't want to uh, offend anyone here, but I like to be but, uh, realistic about it. So you were saying the Romans killed him, but they had, Pilate wanted to release him, but because he said he was the Son of God, I guess nobody could say that's where he got in trouble. Yeah. Well, Pilate's that's wife is was Claudia. She was the the, uh, the niece of the of the emperor at the time, and. And she had dreams about this Jesus, right? And she goes and tells Pilate, hey, have nothing to do with this righteous man. I've suffered many things on a dream because of him this night. And Pilate took her seriously because he had to. I mean, she was the person with social status in that relationship. And he was immediately unhappy with the situation. But by all, um, by all accounts and all evidences, Pontius Pilate was not a man, a refined man of conscience and, and uh, self-reflection. He was a brutal military man and, you know, in any other circumstance he wouldn't have thought a thing about killing any one of the people of Jerusalem. In fact, um, when he was first stationed as the, uh, uh, the, the, the government chief for Jerusalem, one of the first things he did uh, was lead a um, uh, quelling of a riot where almost a thousand people were killed by Roman centurions. Uh, so he was a brutal guy. And, and he probably was afraid of what his wife said, yeah. but otherwise he wouldn't have been afraid. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I, it is getting late. I, um, I guess I'm going to turn it over to you guys. We can talk about whatever you want to. When are you going to write a book? 
summarize it all. <laughs> Um, every yeah, I'm, I'm trying to put together a book on my last lecture because everyone really liked it. This one here is not as good. I'm sorry. I apologize. Oh, yeah, no, it's cool. my, it's, uh, still got it going, yeah. Um, um, no, we, we should thank you at this point. You've gone, you've gone on a long time and uh, you filled it hundreds of questions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was excellent. Thanks, Kevin. You'll come again, right? Thank you for, for having me. Oh. It, was, uh, it was an honor. Thank I, you. I would like to do anything. I, uh, unlike you guys, I'm a, uh, I'm a climate vegan. I'm a, I, my motivation is the ecology. Um, Since uh, the age of 16? Uh, well, I was a vegetarian. I, I was a vegan for like a year and a half, and I didn't know what I was doing back then, right? So I, I wasn't very successful. I, was, um, I, got, I lost a lot of weight. And, I wasn't doing well, and I had to go back to eating uh, dairy and stuff, right? And um, so I was a, a lacto vegetarian for a lot of, lot of years. Uh, Paul is the one who really sort of, I mean, talking to him first, like back in 2009, right? he and I took a German class together, right? Trying to learn German. Both of us had a hard time with that. <laughs> um, and talking to him, he really kind of it kind of stuck in my mind the things that he said, and I, and I realized, hey, you know, I need to be a vegan because it's the right thing to do for ecological reasons. Yeah, so I, I do it for ecological reasons, and and you guys don't get me wrong; it's not that I don't care about animals; I do. Uh, but I tell you what, I care more about. Than, than a particular animal or a particular species or anything is all of the life on Earth. And if we don't get our stuff together, we're going to kill this planet. And we're going to kill it quick. Yeah. It's, it's only going to take a hundred more years of doing what we've been doing. And this planet will not support human life. It probably won't support most of the other life either. There will be cockroaches and scorpions left. They'll continue. And the Twinkies. Yeah, and the Twinkies. <laughs> oh, and, and the Happy Meals. <laughs> yeah. They'll still be around. There'll be a Happy Meal in uh, Reykjavik uh, in display. <laughs> yes. Thanks for coming, guys. I hope I didn't disappoint you. One question. Have you signed on to Anita Krein's uh, Climate Vegan campaign? I, you know what? You guys.